Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us to, uh, to receive your word. Father, I thank you for the people that have gathered, and I would ask that your word accomplish your purpose, that it not go forth without returning, that it would perform your will, that your scripture might be used in a way that would, first of all, glorify you, and secondly, convict us, and third, edify us. Lord, I pray that the text of scripture would not be stretched or skewed or taken out of context to make the the point of a mere man, but I pray that you would allow it to be used in a way that would convey to us the truth designed by your Holy Spirit. So Father, bless us now as we gather around the text and we discuss what it means to, to reclaim the gospel. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, in 1858, was preaching a message on Samson, and he wanted to explain some great feats of those of faith, of, of believers, closer to his day, and he had this to say. He said, quote, those great preachers whose names we remember were men who counted nothing of their own. They were driven out of their pulpits because they would not conform to the established church, and they gave up all, the, uh, all that they had to to willingly serve the Lord. They were hunted from place to place. They wandered here and there to preach the gospel to a few poor sheep, being fully given up to their Lord. Those were foul times, but they promised that they would walk the road, fair or foul, and they did walk it, knee-deep in mud, and they would have walked it knee-deep in blood, too. The men that Spurgeon was referring to were those ejected from their pulpits by the British Parliament in 1662. On the 24th of August of that year, the Act of Uniformity was set to come into effect, and it demanded that all ministers in England, they must comply, the law said, with the Book of Common Prayer as adopted by the Church of England. This was in part a response to the restoration of Charles II, who came after the reign of the Puritan leader Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector of Scotland, England, and Ireland. Cromwell, as you probably know, was a, a Puritan, and he had by his side the great Puritan leader, the one that Charles Spurgeon called the Prince of Divines, John Owen, and they created what we might consider a brief tenure period where truly the good guys were in charge. When Charles II came to power after Cromwell had died and his son then failed to keep together his father's coalition of power, Charles II resumed the throne and when he did that, he and the Church of England set their sights on the Puritans that made their life so terrible for those ten years. They set their sights on the Puritans and decided to rid the world of them, or at least do their best trying. That day would live in infamy as the act of uniformity took place. It was passed on St. Bartholomew's Day in England. Dissenters lived to call that day Black Bartholomew's Day. On that day, those Puritan ministers who would not conform to the religious consensus of the day were to be ejected from their pulpits with no further ado. Numbering around 2,500 ministers, the number included men like Richard Baxter, John Flavel, John Bunyan, Thomas Brooks, Thomas Watson. J.C. Ryle would go on to explain the great ejection as, quote, causing injury to the cause of true religion in England that would probably never be repaired. Speaking of this day, 300 years later, in 1962, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones claimed that, quote, all that is good in evangelicalism finds its roots in the Puritanism that was so fiercely persecuted in the great ejection and the oppression that followed. Edward Hancock referred to the events as, quote, that unrighteous act that slew in one day 2,000 able and faithful ministers of the gospel. Now, those included in the group of nonconformists would be papists who will not count for tonight's exercise because they're not Christians. Uh, 
Congregationalists that included about 130 or so Calvinistic Baptist churches, 110 or so Arminianistic Baptist churches, and most, nine out of ten of those churches, counting in the number of nonconformity, were Presbyterians. Both the Congregationalists and the Presbyterians were often referred to as that title that is as ill defined as it is nebulous, and that is Puritan. These men, knowing that they would refuse to abide by the act of uniformity, lest they accept false doctrine and preach something against their conscience before God, they chose one last sermon from their pulpits to be preached on August 17. And then they walked out into the streets as criminals and as wanted men, refusing to stop their preaching in the streets and in the open air, many of them walking straight into the prison cells and gallows. Ian Murray cites a quotation from one historian. Listen to this as he describes that day, August 17, 1662. No Sunday in England ever resembled exactly what befell them on the 17th of August, 1662, one week before the Feast of St. Bartholomew. There have been mourning and there's been lamentation and woe in particular parish churches when death or persecution or some other cause has broken pastoral ties and severed from loving congregations their spiritual guides. But for many hundreds of ministers on the same day to be uttering farewells is really an unparalleled circumstance. In after years, Puritan fathers and mothers would tell their children the story about how all of the crowds assembled and there were aisles and standing room only places and stairs filled the suffocation of people clinging to open windows like swarms of bees, of overflowing throngs, of churchyards and streets, of deep silence and stifled sobs as the flock gazed at the shepherd, quote, sorrowing most of all that they should never see his face behind the pulpit again. The persecution of the nonconformists, who Spurgeon said were the finest generation ever to preach the gospel, was none too light. Men like Bunyan went to prison many times with their wives. Bunyan, for example, was there for 12 years. As men left their conforming churches, they built non-conforming churches, most of whom had backbones of steel. Let me give you some examples. One Baptist church in Kent disciplined a member for creeping into corners and getting on all fours when the authorities came by the window, claiming that he was, quote, hiding his light under the bushel for fearing arrest. They disciplined him for that. The Baptist church in Bristol would put teenagers at the door as lookouts, and then they would escape the mayor's attempts to arrest them by by fleeing through cellars and through open uh, cupboards that led to hidden rooms. Eventually, they tried this. They would put a curtain in front of the pulpit so that no one could see the preacher so that in case there were spies in the service, they couldn't later identify him and arrest him. In 1678, Scott Wallace, a pastor, was saved from arrest when several very pregnant women put themselves between the preacher and the arresting authorities. Another pastor by the name of Joseph Audie would preach mounted on a horse. He'd never get off the horse. He'd preach in the woods on the horse in case they came to arrest him during the service. He could take off. Even arresting them would not quiet them. Bunyan continued his role of pastor at a church he built within the jail. One man by the name of Jenkin died while he was imprisoned in jail. And one nobleman, one nonconforming nobleman, approached the king and he said, Dear King Charles, may it please you, your majesty, to know that Jenkins has been given his freedom. And King Charles, angry at who would give him his freedom, said, Who was that? The nonconformists responded, one greater than you, your majesty, the king of kings. And he sat there dumbstruck, realizing that at the end of the day, there was nothing that he or anyone else was going to be going to be able to do to shut up the nonconformists. That's the thing about nonconformity. They have a tendency not to conform. Chiefly, the act of uniformity came to an end in 1689, only after the crown, tired of imprisoning fining and persecuting the nonconformists. Eventually they won, but uh, only because the nation grew tired of enforcing laws that would never, ever, ever be 
followed by the ornery nonconformists, forming their backbone of tempered steel. And by the way, I say all of that, and I give that historical synopsis, because as we talk about reclaiming the gospel, I think it's healthy to look at history past and see how it is, not only that they reclaimed the gospel, but how they held fast to it. Because I tell you this, in our culture, it is just as common to have the gospel disappear from the pulpits as on the day of August 17, 1662. Forming their backbone of tempered steel was one underlying commonly held doctrine among the vast majority of those called nonconformists. Now again, nine out of ten of those were Presbyterians. Some were Congregationalists and Baptists, and most of the Baptists were what we would call Calvinistic or Reformed Baptists, holding to the doctrines of grace or what we might call Calvinism or the sovereignty of God. Of these men, uh, several generations later, Robert Schindler writes in the downgrade lectures in Spurgeon's Sword in the Trial, he writes these words, he says, with the ejectment of 2,000 ministers who preferred freedom and purity of conscience to the retention of their livings, Calvinism was banished from the Church of England, excepting so far as the articles were concerned, and Arminianism took its place. Then the state church, which the great reformers had planted, and which some of them had watered with their blood, presented the spectacle which went so far as to justify the sarcasm of an eminent writer that she possessed, quote, get this is how they described it, a popish liturgy, a Calvinistic creed, and an Arminian clergy. Spurgeon writes, the ejected were Calvinists almost to a man. In other words, the vast, vast sum of those men who said, I will not compromise the word of God, were those holding to what we might refer to as the doctrines of grace. Schindler goes on to write, with the endorsement of Spurgeon in his magazine, he says, the ejected who were in one sense alone as the first nonconformists, they were mainly Presbyterians. Some, however, were independents, a few Baptists. The churches they established were all Calvinistic in their faith, and such they remained for at least that generation. It is, it is a matter of verifiable history, he writes. Unfortunately, that some of them did not continue for any great length of time. Some of them, in the course of two or three generations, or even less, became either Arian or Socinian. This was eventually the case with nearly all the Presbyterians, and later on with some of the independents and many of the, the general Baptist communities. By some means or other, first the ministers and then the churches got on the downgrade, and in some cases, the descent was rapid and in all very disastrous. In proportion as the ministers seceded from the old Puritan godliness of life and the old Calvinistic form of doctrine, they commonly became less earnest and less simple in their preaching, more speculative and less spiritual in the matter of their discourses, and dwelt more on the moral teachings of the New Testament than on the great central truths of Revelation. Natural theology frequently took the place of great truths of the gospel. And those sermons became more and more Christless. What he says is, is they abandoned the doctrines of grace and God's sovereignty over salvation. With it, they also abandoned the very gospel itself. His assertion was clear as those great nonconformists became comfortable in their newfound freedom during the uh, uh, act of toleration, when they were then allowed to observe the religion as they saw fit, they did a peculiar thing. They abandoned Calvinism, and with it they ushered in the phenomenon that we know historically as the downgrade, an era of compromise and the loosening of Christianity, the dumbing down of Christian doctrine. He continues to write, and he says, Some of the ministers retained their Calvinistic soundness and the purity of their character in life. As these, as a general rule, they gave prominence to the doctrines of the gospel, and they were zealous in their ministry, but some embraced Arminian sentiments. While others professed to take a, mid a middle path, these displayed not only less zeal for the salvation of sinners, and in many cases less purity in the strictness of their life, but they adopted a different strain in preaching. They dwelt more on general... Now, let me stop here for a moment and ask you, does this sound familiar to you? Not only were they less pure in their strictness of life, but they adopted a different strain of preaching, 
They dwelt more on general principles of religion, sound familiar, and less on the vital truths of the gospel. Ruin by sin, regeneration by the Holy Spirit, and redemption by the blood of Christ. Truths on the preaching of which God has always set the seal of his approbation were conspicuously absent. You see, there was in the assessment of Spurgeon and and Robert Schindler and in historians like Ian Murray a consensus. To loosen the bounds of Calvinism is to loosen one's grip on the very gospel itself. And so that long introduction to this message is given for this reason. While we gather to discuss restoring the gospel, we must learn our lesson from history well. Our fixation on the gospel will stray no further than our departure from the doctrines of sovereign grace. And shall we lose, forget, or forsake the doctrines of grace, then we will, like so many before us, lose the gospel itself in the process. At the latter half of the 20th century, even, uh, evangelicalism, if, if, if it could be characterized anyway, particularly in the West, it might rightly be characterized as not the greater but the lesser ejection. In the 20th century, in Canada as well as in the United States, there was no act of conformity. There was no act of uniformity. But there was no doubt a slow bleed of many thousands of ministers ejected from their pulpits for holding to the Calvinism of the nonconformists. In fact, I know some of you Canadian brethren in this very room who have been ejected from your pulpits for no other reason than that you have held to the doctrines of grace that were preached by Jesus, preached by Paul, preached by Augustine, preached by the Reformers, and preached by the nonconformists. And you probably know them too. This slow ejection has bled many of Canada's pulpits dry of authentic gospel and replaced them with moralistic, man-made religion designed to give you some type of esoteric purpose and to give you your best life now. That ejection, that slow ejection, has stabilized, thankfully in recent years, because of a a short resurgence in Reformed theology. But uh, understand this, and make no mistake about it, the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ is as offensive as ever. And while we may not be imprisoned for preaching these truths, many a pastor has been placed in the purgatory of public opinion or interned in the prison of censure and muzzle. In other words, just because they're not fired doesn't mean they're not told to shut up. It often happens. But let that not be said of us. Let us not conform to the spirit of our age and Let us then resist the modern-day downgrade together, brethren. Turn to Romans 9, if you would. Romans 9. It would be quite impossible to recover the gospel without recovering the doctrines of grace. As you turn there, let me remind you of the words of Charles Spurgeon, his very first words at the London Metropolitan Tabernacle. Spurgeon said this, he said, The truth that Calvin preached that Augustine preached, that Paul preached, is the truth that I must preach today or else be false to my conscience and to God. Spurgeon says, I cannot shape the truth. I know such thing as paring off the rough edges of a doctrine. John Knox's gospel is my gospel, and that which thundered through Scotland must thunder through England again. Uh, For Spurgeon, there was no difference between the doctrines of grace and the very gospel itself. It's here, though, that we turn not to dead men, but we turn to living Scripture, and we peer over the shoulder of the Apostle Paul into the oracles of God and see what God's Word says. Paul begins his treatise in Romans 9 on divine election by lamenting the loss of many Israelites under the Old Covenant, so many who remain under the covenant of works, and in so doing they remain under the curse of sin. Paul says that he has great sorrow, quote, great sorrow and unceasing anguish for his Jewish kin. And he goes so far as to say that he wishes it were possible that, be, that he be cut off from the mercies of God if it could by some means save them. He points out that the Israelites had first dibs on the mercies of God, including the blessings of being chosen first to be in line for adoption as God's sons. They were the first to view the glory of God, first to be given the covenants, first to be given the law, first to observe true worship, and the first to receive his promises. And chiefest among his promises, 
is the promised coming seed who would redeem his people, who would actually come through them. He says they were given the patriarchs, and from them the Messiah would come. Paul, speaking of the spoiled advantages of the Jews and their self-inflicted plague of missed opportunity, look to verse 6, he says this, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now, what is beautiful about Romans 9, one of many different things, is that Paul plays what I call not the devil's advocate, but the Arminian's advocate. He repeatedly deals with unspoken but assumed skepticism. He is assuming that people are skeptical as he is writing this letter to the Romans, and that's very good. It's very good because people are naturally skeptical when they read Paul's letter to the Romans. That makes perfect sense. And so Paul is explaining to them answers that you don't necessarily see people asking, but they are. The Arminian's advocate is here presumed, as some might ask the question, now hold on a second, if, if these Israelites are damned under the law that they can't fulfill, well, then did God's promise fail? That is the question that is presumed. If theirs was of the covenants, as Paul says in verse 4, then why are they cut off and accursed? Did God not make a covenant with Abraham, the skeptic might ask? What about the sons of Abraham? They were circumcised. Did God not agree to redeem them? This is the skeptical question which Paul answers without even having to ask it. It is not as though the word of God failed, he says. The fact is, Paul says, not all who are descended from Israel really belong to Israel. And likewise, not all who belong to Abraham are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Listen, this may be hard for the audience to understand. They might ask him, what do you mean, Paul? What do you mean that not all the children of Abraham really belong to Abraham or not all the children of Israel belong to Israel? What does that mean? Well, Paul then reminds the audience of Genesis chapter 21, verse 12. The scripture says, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now, they would have known this and, and they might have said, well, Okay, we understand that concept, makes sense to us. God has promised to bless the seed of Abraham, and we recognize, we astute, biblically informed Jews, we recognize that that promise didn't come to us through Ishmael, even though Ishmael was the seed of Abraham. We would understand that that promised seed came through Isaac. Likewise, we would understand that that promised seed did not come from Esau. We get that. We would recognize that it came through Israel. The spiritual seed of Israel does not include all of those who have the DNA of Abraham. Now, th again, they would have understood this. Paul furthers his point by drawing more parallels to the Old Testament. Look to verse 8. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. Now, it's here that Paul begins to make his point that will form his thesis for the sovereignty of God regarding salvation. He writes in verse 9, For this is what the promise said, About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And so here Paul reminds them of Sarah, the wife of Abraham and mother of Isaac, the son of the promise. Then Paul reminds us of Rebekah, the wife of Isaac and father of Jacob, the son of promise, with two generations of patriarchs to serve as the example. Paul gives the skeptic a frame of reference from the Old Testament. Again, God chose Isaac, not Ishmael. God chose Jacob, not Esau. God is sovereign over such decisions, and not all who have born, been born of the flesh of Abraham belong to the Spirit of God. It's here that the skeptic might say, yes, but God knows the future, and he simply knew whether or not he would prefer Esau or Jacob, or perhaps Ishmael or Isaac. 
It's there that we say, but you're misunderstanding how it is that God knows the future. God is not clairvoyant. It's not as though he is psychic. He knows the end from the beginning, not because he is a seer who sees into a crystal ball, but he knows the end from the beginning because it is he who causes it. It is because he is the actor, the architect of the ages, the one designing it. He's not responding or reacting because that would imply that there is a force that is greater than God. And nothing acts upon God. He is always the cause, always the source of action, and never the reaction. So he wants them to understand, listen, it's not as though God shows these men because of something that he would see in them. That's not it at all. Now let us, just for the sake of our own foolishness and curiosity, let's consider for a moment that God shows Jacob because he looked down the corridors of time and would see the things that Jacob would do and compare them to the things that Esau would do, and then because of their actions, he chose to love one before they were born and chose to hate the other one. I never understood the problem with Esau when I was a child. As my father explained Esau to us in the boys' Bible study in the basement of the the Plato Baptist Church, my father said, well, first of all, he was a hairy man, we know from Scripture, and he liked... He liked to hunt. He was outside hunting like a man, providing for his family. He comes home famished, and then this mama's boy is in the kitchen, takes advantage of him in his weakness. Esau is nice enough not to rip the little man limb from limb. He is hungry, does something foolish, but then Jacob steals his birthright, tricks his own father, gets pawned by his uncle, runs for his life like a little coward. I could go on. I would much rather be on team Esau than team Jacob any day. Furthermore, we see this notion. The purpose was not what they had done or what they would ever do, but the scripture says it was chosen by God so that the, quote, purpose of God's election might stand. It was not dealing with purposes found within those individuals. Friends, understand this when we preach the gospel. Whether or not you are saved has nothing to do with anything that is found inside of you. But it is by grace. So the purpose of God's election might stand. In other words, get this, God's choice in saving some and not saving others is not arbitrary. God is not doing any meeny miny mo. No, God has a purpose. It's the purpose of his election. Furthermore, as I've explained, it's not tied up in the individual at all, but it's tied up intrinsically, the scripture says here, not in the one who works, Not in the one who works, but in he who calls, and that is God himself. God's choice to save the individual has nothing to do with the individual, and everything to do with God's choice is determined by his purposes. So then, it should not surprise us that God hated Esau. What should surprise us is that God loved Jacob. The giving of God justice or justice from God to the sinner, should never surprise us. Do you want to understand in one quick sentence or paragraph exactly how messed up evangelicalism is today? The fact that God gives justice to deserving deserving sinners is seen as controversial and offensive. But the notion that God gives love equally to all men is almost a foregone conclusion among people that need to be more closely studying the Scripture. So God's choice in saving some and not saving others is not arbitrary. It serves a purpose. Look to verse 14. The Arminian's advocate speaks up again and says, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, for he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So then Paul, as I said, explains to us uh, sort of an apologetic for how we get around that question. Is there any injustice with God? The natural mind upon whose uh, throne reigns the idol of free will, 
says that if God has decided whom he shall love and whom he shall hate, God is therefore somehow unjust. But again, Paul answers the critic with an explanation from the Old Testament. Listen, you all should understand the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, God says, I'll have mercy on whom I want to have mercy. I'll have compassion upon whom I want to have compassion. Here, God says, what business is it of yours who I give my mercy to? Sinner, why do you think that you're owed forgiveness? Who told you that you were entitled to grace? Who are you to demand that God treat all people equally? Was it your blood that was shed on Calvary? Were you the one that sent your son? Are you our high priest? Stop telling God who he has to give his grace and mercy to. Stop it. God is sovereign over these things, just as he was with Pharaoh. He will give mercy to whom he wants to give mercy. The apostle is pushing back on the self-centered, self-idolatrizing man who has made free will into his Savior. And Paul pushes back hard. For this very purpose, God raised up Pharaoh. Now, how sweet, someone might say, who doesn't know their Bible very well. It sounds like something that Joel Osteen might preach if you didn't understand the context. God has raised you up to make his power known in you. Except the problem being, God raised up Pharaoh and made his power known throughout the whole world in Pharaoh by relentlessly, ferociously, unapologetically hardening his heart and then squashing him like a bug under the righteous fury of his indignation. The last thing you would want is God to raise you up to display his power in you the way he did Pharaoh and in the context of Romans chapter 9. Making his case regarding Pharaoh... Paul reiterates that God will have mercy on whomever he wants. And it's here that the Arminian's advocate again protests. That's imputing God. That's implying that God doesn't treat everyone exactly the same way. That would be bad of God. That would even be a double standard. God would think one way of one individual and not think of another way of another individual. And, of course, the way they compensate that in their own mind is that they pretend that salvation is somehow merited by the individual, therefore making God fair. Paul rephrases their skepticism as this, who will then find fault? Look to verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man? To answer back to God. Paul's blood pressure is rising, if you can't tell. It's kind of interesting. He is himself playing the role of the skeptic, and I think he's even getting a little bit tense, I would presume from what I see in the the scripture here, from the arguments that he himself is providing himself as he's arguing with the skeptic of the role that he's playing. Here's what it demonstrates. You get two or three different answers and explanations and apologies for God's sovereignty before the gospel preacher gets to the point where he says, how about this? How about you don't answer back to God because you're man and he's God? We can provide some apologetic answers for the skeptic of God's sovereignty. when they. I'm not saying go to that first off. Paul gave some reasonable explanation from Scripture. He reasoned with them from the Word of God, but then reached the point where Paul says, I'm done making apologies for God. Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Like, who do you think you are? He's God. You're not. Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Verse 21, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable? Here he's alluding to Isaiah 45 and Isaiah 64. Paul speaks of the absurdity of a man who is nothing but a creature of the dust who's speaking back to the God who made him. Can you imagine the absurdity of that? You're a dirt creature. You're talking back to God. And so he responds with sheer force of the authority of an apostle. And he says to the critic, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Oh, but it's not fair for God to do this, says the sinner. 
And the spirit of the apostle answers back, And ye, dear, dear sinner, you shall be used to store vile refuse, and you will be thrown into the fire as waste and as kindling, because it is the potter's right to take out of one lump of clay vessels for honorable use and those for dishonorable use. And the analogy that he's working on is that of a bedpan. Who do you think you are? Have you noticed that when some people do evangelism, what they do is make it so that people think very highly of themselves? That is the religion of Antichrist. That is not the religion of Christianity. Verse 22, again, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared beforehand for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he's prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he's called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Now, the skeptic, he is like a petulant child asking the question repeatedly, what about this? Uh, What about that? How could God do this? Why would God do that? And here Paul returns the favor, and he uses the skeptic's preferred method of making a point by asking loaded questions and feigned open-mindedness. Paul gives them a question, and here's the question. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power with great patience, made sinners prepared for destruction in order to make the riches of his glory designed for his mercy, those very same ones who he prepared beforehand for his glory. After clarifying to the skeptic that God will do whatever it is that he wants in regards to the salvation of men, he says with what I believe to be a semi-sarcastic tone, mimicking the imaginary critic, he asks the question, what if? He's returning the question to the skeptic. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make his power known, took time with great patience to prepare sinners, prepared for destruction, just so those he's chosen could see and appreciate the glories of his mercy, he asked the skeptic. What if? What will you say to God? That's not fair. The best way I can describe this picture, because I get it, it sounds harsh, I understand that. The best way I can describe the picture is this. I have an 11-year-old son named Judah, he's here Uh, this weekend with me. He's always been a builder of some sort. I hope he becomes an engineer or something someday, something like that, Uh, an architect perhaps. Since he was a a little tyke, he was a builder, and he would make houses and cities and castles and, and forts. You know how little boys are. He would use his Lincoln logs and his connector sets, his Legos and building blocks, and, and then there would disappear from around the house shoe boxes and and tissue boxes, and every little thing that he could use to build an empire of his own civilization inside his room, even at a few years of age. And the buildings would be piled as high as him, and he'd get on chairs to erect skyscrapers, much like the pagans built the Tower of Babel. (laughs) And he he would lay it out exactly as he would have it. Everything exactly as he wanted it. And if, if I would happen to, to come by and, and see something I thought should change and I were to move it uh, after I left, he would put it back. It was exactly as he wanted it. How dare anyone change the magnificent city that he had crafted for his own amusement. No hair left unaltered, no corner not straight, everything perfectly as he desired it. And then you know how the story ends. Because he's a little boy. And little boys stand back and look at their creation with imminent pride. And then it turns into like Godzilla on the city of Japan. He takes out his wiffle ball bat, destroys it with impunity. And, and how he built it was very intentional, exactly the way he wanted it. Because he was the one that would also bring it down. What if God choosing to make known his wrath and power, bore with great patience the objects of wrath, prepared beforehand for destruction. Someone asked the question, why hath God made me this way? Because you are exactly, perhaps, the way he wants you to be when he cast you into hell. That's bad news. Anybody want to hear some good news? 
that makes us understand that grace cannot be demanded, and it's free. And so the skeptic says, why? That sounds awful. And I would say, do you not see? It is to make the riches of his glory for the objects of his mercy, that is, believers, to make us understand his greatness. Well, how does that work exactly? I'll give you another example. Have you ever seen anyone die in a car accident? Perhaps just a car ahead of you or a car behind? I was in Jonesboro, Arkansas one time pumping gas, and I saw an SUV take out a man on a motorcycle. Hit him so hard his shirt came off before he hit the ground. He hit the ground and slid over the pavement practically to my feet. There was no checking his pulse. No one checked to see if he was breathing. There was no CPR. He was very clearly dead. And being in that intersection just a few moments before, the first thought that went through my mind, and I felt very guilty for even thinking it was, dear God, that could have been me. Thank you. And that's my first thought. And that's your first thought, probably, that goes through your mind when you see a tragedy. 30 seconds sooner, 30 seconds later, that could have been me. And the only reason it wasn't was God's grace. Listen, one day at the judgment, God, who is judge, that is Christ, both of the quick and the dead, that judgment will come. And in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, all of Hades and all of the dead in Hades are judged and they're cast into hell. And yet, even though it is only the dead of Hades that are cast into hell, it would seem that all believers are present at that judgment. When the books are opened, the dead are judged, great and small, sinner and saint, and will be judged by the contents of those books, comprising the full recording of their sin. And yet, only the residents of Hades are cast into a place of eternal conscious torment for those violations. And the redeemed, who are just as personally guilty as the others, will be free to go based upon the priesthood of Jesus Christ. It is then and in that moment that you will have a front row seat to the judgment of the damned. Why? It is because then and only then, as you see your acquaintances, your cousins, your nephews, your nieces, your brothers, your sisters, possibly your mother and father, cast into the lake of fire, that then more than any other time, you will know the meaning of the phrase except for the grace of God, there go I. It is then more than any other time you will sing of the marvelous grace of Christ given to you without merit and undeservedly. The moment grace from God is not free on God's part is the moment that we've changed the gospel. It's here the skeptic again asks, why would God make people that he knew would one day end up in hell? And the answer is very clear if you've been given ears to hear. There are two reasons. First, God created people he knew would go to hell because he's chosen not to save them. Likewise, the reason why there are people who God created who he would save is because he wanted to save them. Get this, this is hard for us to understand. God is glorified when he gives justice to deserving sinners. Amen? God is similarly glorified when he gives grace to undeserving sinners. And hence we have the purpose for all humanity. Or else the destruction of the damned is merely some unfortunate incident that an omniscient and omnipotent God couldn't foresee or control. But there's a purpose in it. And it's the purpose of his election. Now, it's this passage, Romans 9, that I read one day when I was a sales manager of a car lot down in the Bible Belt of America. I had been a pastor since the age of 17, which I feel it would be irresponsible if I didn't say, never let a 17-year-old be a pastor. I left the ministry at 23 because, quite frankly, I, I didn't like it. I hated it. I felt as though I was forced into it. And then I 
was reading the scripture on the computer screen one day, again, as a working at this car lot, and I came across Romans 9. And I thought to myself, this must not be right. I need a different translation. I thought to myself, this can't be right. This cannot possibly be saying what I think it's saying. And each and every time I found myself being a skeptical Arminian, enthralled with the glories of my own free will, I found myself confronted with the Apostle Paul's plane of the devil's advocate. Well, it's unjust, I thought. And then Paul said, are you calling God unjust? Well, then why would God find fault? And Paul says, let me explain it to you, son. And he goes into great detail. Paul writes these verses that would forever change my life. To this day, it's my favorite verse in all of Scripture. Who are you? Get in your place, man. You're not God. And it's there that I read Romans 9 over and over and over again. Each day I wrestled with the text. I, 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 I fought with the text. I covered corporate election. Yeah, maybe that's it. No, that's not it. Maybe, maybe I didn't understand the nuance of this Pelagian idea or that one. But then, by God's mercy, he eventually broke me. And I've always described accepting the doctrines of grace a little bit like the, the, the stages of grief. Have you heard about that? First, there's denial. That can't be right. And, and then there's anger. Well, it may be true, but I don't have to like it. And then eventually acceptance. It's just the way it is. And then embrace. Do you not see the glory in this? Do you not see the glory what God, of what God has done in this? And you begin to embrace it. You see, that reality of the sovereignty of God over salvation changed everything regarding my view of God. First and foremost, I understood this for the first time. God didn't have to save me. In my mind, I was a good little boy and didn't do too many things that I shouldn't have done as a child. And I chose Jesus as though, I don't know, it was PE class. And he was the last kid in line to be picked for dodgeball. That I chose Jesus and, and I'm on the right team. And then I saw I could have been destined for hell and God could have sent me and judged me to a thousand hells and heaven would have applauded and it wouldn't have been less. God saved me by his own choice and his grace. And for the first time, I actually wanted to worship God. This is why Calvinists oftentimes talk about conversion to Reformed theology as salvation or a born-again experience. Well, I knew my Savior, and I did trust in Him for my sins. But I was arrogant in that, because I didn't understand that it was He who worked in me both to will and to do. And then for the first time in my life, I understood the words of Isaac Watts, who lived during the time of nonconformity, although as a teenager. Isaac Watts, the hymn writer, writes this. He says, Behold the potter and the clay. He forms his vessels as he please. Such is our God and such are we, the subjects of his high decrees. Doth not the workman's power extend over all the mass which part to choose and mold it for a nobler end and which to leave for viler use? May not the sovereign Lord on high dispense his favor as he will? Choose some to life while others die and yet be just and gracious still. What if to make his terror known, he lets his patience long endure, suffering vile rebels to go on and seal their own destruction sure? What if he means to show his grace and his electing love employs to mark out some of mortal race and form them fit for heavenly joys? Shall man reply against the Lord and call his maker's ways unjust? The thunder of whose dreadful word can crush a thousand worlds to dust. But, O oh my soul, if truths so bright should dazzle and confound thy sight, yet still this written will obey and wait the great decisive day. Then shall he make his justice known and the whole world before his throne with joy of terror shall confess the glory of his righteousness. How essential is the doctrine of God's sovereignty in reclaiming the gospel? Why? It's for this reason. Because in order to understand the need for your saving, you need to understand your helpless state without him. 
This isn't a matter of your decision. This isn't a matter of your will. This is a matter of the third person of the Holy Trinity saving your soul and making you born again. It's not about your mental faculties. It's about God's graciousness to reach down and save you. Understand, sinner, you need God. He doesn't need you. Now, much is said today about contextualizing the gospel, so much so that many men and many self-pronounced missiologists, speaking of a made-up word, make careers out of editing the gospel just to make it more palatable to a lost and fallen culture, to contextualize it for them in the name of fashionability. So then, let me contextualize the gospel for you so that our fallen culture can understand it. And this is the best way that I contextualize the gospel for you, I believe. How's this? Jesus died for those who self-identify as sinners. We have to identify not just as those who have sinned, but we must identify as those who know that they are by nature sinners. And there are many people who know that they've sinned, but the moment you call them sinners, the moment they say, now hold on a second, you've gone too far. I'm not. I'm a really good person that does some terribly wicked things almost every day, sometimes constantly. But I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. To make the point, I'll quote from John Owen, who lived long enough to see the demise of the Cromwell family and the rise of the nonconformists. John Owen preached this. He said, The Arminians, determining to demolish the building of divine providence and sovereign grace and unmerited favor, by which men have ascended into heaven, they have by degrees erected a new tower of Babel whose top they would persuade us can reach into heaven. First, therefore, the foundation stones they've brought forth, but they've laid them on the sandy, rotten ground of our own nature. They endeavor to draw both the praise to God and the rectitude to their own nature and the strength of their own endeavors. But let them enjoy their own wisdom, which is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Owen describes the denial of these doctrines of sovereign grace to be no different than to build your own tower of Babel, in which you can ascend heaven by your own strength. God hath destroyed that tower once already, and he destroys it every time a man of God preaches the gospel behind the pulpit, in which the idol of man is cast down. Man is thought less of, and God is thought more of. All false religion of any stripe, from any tribe, tongue, any heretic, sect, or tradition, all false religion promises that based upon your merit and goodness, you will be rewarded by whatever is your chosen divine power. If we are to reclaim the gospel, we must fight with Scripture as vehemently against that notion of self-salvation as we should fight the idolatry of the papal mass. There is no different, and both are damning. The natural tendency of our churchmen to presume that their salvation hinges on some small part of their own doing is a modern-day Tower of Babel. It stretches forth from the steeples of many church houses, a devilish assumption that rather than God choosing us, we have instead chosen him. This erects monuments to our pride that inoculate us against not only the authentic gospel, but also against authentic worship. The typical evangelical is more likely to perceive Jesus as a lonely friend that we need to choose than a sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords who reached down into time and space to save us from the righteous wrath of God. And he did so without our permission and neither with our cooperation. This is the natural inclination of men to think this. Whitfield who would come a generation after these nonconformists, said, quote, we are all born Arminians, but it is by the grace of God that we become Calvinists. If we are to reclaim the gospel, we must, as a top priority, reassert our need for it. We must stand behind the pulpit on our street corners and from behind behind the pulpit in the church house, and we have to prophesy to the wind that God is sovereign over his salvation and man's primary need stems from his absolute helplessness to change or better his own spiritual account. Paul and the nonconformists of England both taught the same thing, an utter reliance upon the graciousness, graciousness of God that not only acts without our will, but in spite of what our will is. And without the touch of God, we will never change our will. Placing both man and God in our proper place is essential to reclaim the gospel. 
There are about 70 sermons that we have on file from 55 different ministers. Some of them preach two sermons a day of the 2,500 that got kicked out of their pulpits on August 17, 1662. So we have about 70 of those sermons. And I wanted to read to you, in closing, just part of one from the Puritan Mr. Lyle. As he preached these words, this was his first sermon of the day. Just listen to the words. Wherever you find any doctrine that shall tend to the lifting up of a man's free will and debasing of God's free grace. No, it's a wicked doctrine. And it is against the gospel. Now keep in mind, these were the last words that he chose to share with his church before he would step out into the street and become a wanted man. He wanted to tell them to cling to the doctrines of grace, free grace given by God that you have nothing to do with. You are a passive recipient of the goodness of God, and now your job is to receive God's mercy and bear forth his glory in awe of him. So he says, if you find any doctrine, because he's leaving the pulpit and he knows it won't be guarded. He says, if you find any doctrine that lifts up man and brings down God's glory, it's a wicked doctrine. Perhaps the papists will tell you, he says, you are alive. But Paul says that we are dead. They say that we can do anything. Many things we talk to the world we cannot do. They say that we can save ourselves and close with Christ if we will. Whereas the apostle tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It may, he says to his church, it may, they will tell you, a natural man may love God with his heart as though he really and truly does, but the apostle tells you that the carnal man is at enmity with God. He says, remember it in all those doctrines wherein we agree with those who we call Pelagians and Arminians so far as we agree with the Jesuits and the worst of all, the Papists. Either we will be saved, listen to this, either we will be saved by Christ alone or we will not be saved by Christ at all. This is what is at stake. True and adulterated gospel. Good news. If you will be saved, what must you do? Be born again. How can you be born again? Believe. Receive what God is doing. And furthermore, even the faith by which we believe is given by God. But you must repent. And the repentance is a work of God. Salvation by God, from God, for God. It's the heart of the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the time that we've gathered. We thank you for the men that will preach and for those men and women and children who will listen. Lord, I would pray as we go longer into the night that you would illumine our minds to receive and to understand what it is that will be given. In Jesus' name, amen.